Namaskar my dear brothers and sisters, boys and girls. You just heard a devotional song in the melodious voice of Karna Didi, <coughs> whom you heard several times earlier, who was synonymous with music at Sri Ashram Delhi branch for more than 50 years. In this uh, particular song, the disciple is praying to the mother for purification. Purification both inner and outer, purification of thoughts and feelings, purification of uh, whatever we do in outer life. Purification going to every nook and corner of the being. And uh, this is uh, one of the most important aspects in uh, sadhana, purification of uh, the body and the mind, purification of our surroundings. And uh, because of uh, the inherent tendency to gravitate towards impurities, uh, the mother has uh, used a very striking expression in the prayers and meditations about this. She calls it the fire of purification. You literally have to go through it and uh, burn the impurities. So it's a rather drastic and uh, somewhat painful process, but all the same, there is no other way. Now, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce, rather reintroduce to you, uh, Monica Tyagi, who uh, gave you a practical class a few days ago. Uh, she did the course on teaching yoga here at the ashram in uh, the year 2008. She was in the first batch, that's the year we started these courses. And uh, after that uh, she has uh, not only done uh, a course and a few stints at the Sevananda ashram in uh, Neyar Dam, Kerala, where she has uh, learned one of uh, the best uh, courses on teaching yoga and uh, then uh, she has also picked up a lot of experience because throughout this period of uh, 12 years plus since she did the course here she has actually been teaching both in the ashram and uh, in her own studio which she calls from pace to peace so with that uh, i pass on the mic to her. Today she'll be not actually doing the practical class with you but uh, talking about making asanas injury proof. That is how to avoid injuries while doing the yogic asanas. Uh, good morning everyone. Thank you sir. Uh, and, uh, thank you for giving me this chance to share my uh, whatever little bit I've learned and uh, my experiences with uh, everyone. So I'll start with a short prayer. Let's all join hands and uh, try to be together with our hearts and our mind. Mm-hmm. Te jasvi na adhi tamastu, Om shanti shanti shanti. All right. So, um, first of all, some of you might be wondering why this topic, how uh, important are injuries or avoiding them and what is a big deal or is this topic a little overrated? Um, so, especially for the younger people, they feel, uh, what's the big deal? You know, you just get a small injury and then you rest for a few days and then you get fine. But unfortunately, what you forget, the body remembers. So as we age, as we get older, these uh, small injuries uh, of the past, they, you know, they crop up again and then they start troubling us. And uh, these injuries of recklessness and carelessness are the ones that uh, trouble us most because they could have been easily avoided. So um, I feel that, you know, of course, physically also they, you know, add to the stress of the body. There's so much 
part of the body energy that goes into healing an injury and it's something so avoidable so why not and why not add that extra energy and that effort into our practice into our uh, you know mental uh, peace and calm so uh, there are a few points that I have enumerated and this list is definitely not exhaustive. You can add to it uh, your own experiences and your own, uh, you know, through your own uh, practice, you can uh, add more points to this. So um, the first thing that we, um, you know, that yoga uh, has offered us is an awareness of breath. So breath or breathing becomes my first point, my first, my first most important point to, uh, towards this topic. So when we talk about breathing, it's not just, you know, this respiration. Scientifically, it's called respiration. But uh, to us, breathing is something that is uh, much more than that. As uh, yoga practitioners, maybe, you know, you are already into uh, a good part of uh, yes one so you must have realized the important of importance of breathing and uh, we start with om we start with om chanting so where does om come from it's our breath that becomes om if you're not religious don't worry about all those aspects of it om you can say is a sound it's a vibration that has a much deeper effect than what the connotation of the word om is so we can leave the religious aspect of it aside then also uh, breathing uh, the way we breathe is a reflection of our state of mind at that moment and our temperament as a whole so if you are constantly breathing uh, you know short and uh, irregular breaths it shows it you know, indicates that there's, there's some stress, there's something that's not right in the mind. So it's our first introduction to ourselves. Sometimes we just don't know us. We don't know our own bodies. We don't know our own minds. You know, that's why uh, people who are very close to us can sometimes understand us better than we ourselves understand us. Because uh, for them, it's all very visible and we just tend to ignore some points. So we try to connect to the breathing because it is a reflection of what's going on inside us. For example, it's very easy to relate to this, that uh, when we are angry, we are breathing short and we are not breathing complete. So that irregular breathing affects our head, our mind, our thought process, which in turn again affects our breathing and we are stuck in a constant loop. So if we take aside a few deep breaths, we realize that, you know, the mind also, the anger to a great extent, it dissipates and, uh, you know, the peace prevails, which is why some of you might remember that uh, as children, I remember, um, you know, telling each other, if you're really angry, count up to 10. So that 10 is not a magical number. That count is not the magic. It's the breathing that's the, the magic because the moment you focus on your breathing and uh, you know, your counting, you focus your mind on something else other than what was angering you. So the situation um, sort of pacifies itself. So breathing, as I said, is a lot more than what we just look at. At a physical level, breathing also helps us, uh, you know, overcome some of the um, limitations that we might have. So sometimes we want to do something uh, like in yoga, like a yogi posture. I'll give you an example. I just, I have a mat at the back so I can quickly also, uh, you know, do some of the postures and uh, illustrate them here and now. So when we lie down and we want to uh, raise the legs, and we feel we don't have the physical strength for it, we do it on an inhale. So the inhale actually gives us the power where we might be slightly lacking in physical strength. So this I don't need to demonstrate, but uh, yeah, so the breathing helps us in that. Um, 
um, probably Sarad already covered this uh, part in his lectures that um, uh, breathing in our physical sense is the continuum to prana, what we call in yoga. Prana and breathing are not exactly the same thing, but to understand prana, we first must understand breathing and hence we do pranayam, which is also a form of breathing only, but that, that is how it goes. So that is why I uh, you know, kept breathing as my first, um, this thing, you know, first startup starting point. So with that, we come to our uh, next point for today, which is uh, warm up. So it might be a physical warm up, it might be a mental warm up. When you come and sit on your yoga mat, the teacher doesn't just immediately start telling you in the postures, okay, get up and start with this. They first, we chant Om and then we, you know, they tell you to put their, your mobile phones on silent. You, so it's all like a preparation. So first we have a mental warm up, we spread our mat, we, uh, you know, uh, keep everything that we might need for the next uh, hour or so of practice. So we start at the mental warm up. And then we move on to the physical warm up, which is, of course, uh, you know, sukshma kriya, moving of the joints, moving of the neck, and all those things. But why is it so necessary? Because, again, physically, and of course, these joints, they, you just can't straight away start, uh, you know, when you start a vehicle, it just doesn't directly go to a hundred speed. It, picks up gradually the engine you might need to rev of course these days the vehicles are different but uh, some of you who might belong to that era of ambassadors and peers you really had to sit and warm up so in humans there's been no uh, you know new models so we <laughs> we are still stuck to that era and our bodies are still on that uh, stage where a little bit of warm up is needed also, for those of you who would want to, you know, go ahead as uh, teachers, my suggestion would be that it also varies as per the weather. So in winters, we need a lot more warm up. Also, uh, some postures or some kriyas that we might be planning to do on that day, it uh, is important to do some uh, warm up moves that might be related to those particular postures. For example, I show you for if on a day you want to, uh, you know, have your students practice uh, Padmasana. So not everyone is able to sit in Padmasana very easily. So on that particular day, you can do more of uh, these ankle rotations and you can do more of uh, this cradle because it helps loosen up at the hip, at the knee. So all these, uh, uh, you know, you take care of the warm up uh, well, and definitely it gives you a better physical practice. So warm up definitely cannot be uh, ignored. So with that, uh, we come to the third point, which is awareness. You do everything with awareness, no? I think I should come back closer because. Uh, uh, so doing the things with awareness, uh, we are already so much into it. We started with awareness of breathing. We started with a good warm up. So awareness is already there. But still, sometimes uh, the mind is, um, you know, of course, everyone has other stuff to do than to just do yoga. So you might be having something that you have to run back to, maybe a meeting, maybe a kid has to be dropped to school and, and all of that. So that compartmentalization of the brain, it, you know, reduces the yoga uh, section or your practice section to smaller and smaller. So we have to kind of pull the hair brain and pull the awareness back to our practice. And uh, that is uh, a very, very important part of, avoiding injuries anything that you do without awareness will definitely you know go wrong sometime or the other so if you uh, i'll just take a quick detour and go to patanjali's yoga sutra which is like the guiding uh, text for a lot of uh, yoga courses so first two uh, you know points that are said is uh, atha yoga anushasana that means now yoga begins 
and the second yoga sutra says yoga chitta vritti nirodha which which means yoga is the controlling of thought waves and when they say ath yoga anushasanam yoga begins which automatically indicates that everything else should stop so when you are practicing yoga you try it's it's we are all on the path of learning and we uh, you know we all need to keep trying to make something a habit but uh, gradually it does come that when you are the moment you are on your mat you stay confined to this 6 by 2 this 12 square feet area and you focus on your breathing on your postures and uh, that is the best way to avoid injuries and not only uh, the extension of this topic is also to make your practice better so not only to avoid injuries but also to make your yoga practice better and quickly give you an example here so uh, a lot of times we are struggling with balancing postures so when you whenever you want to do a balancing posture you just can't uh, you know i'll just quickly get into uh, the most common posture three pose which is a balancing posture i've seen a lot of people in my class so they uh, when they you know when we were doing physical classes especially the people who were late for the class could not do their balances well you can easily see the connection they were late they were maybe you know rushing through traffic and uh, in their mind they were already tense that they are late for the class what all they missed so the mind was agitated i would mostly do balancing postures about half an hour later but still the mind was not calm enough to get a good balance so that complete awareness and that complete peace of the mind that's needed to do a balancing posture is uh, you know it's easily reflected in your balancing postures whenever you want to try a balancing posture like here i'll show you this is my right leg and i want to balance on my right leg i just don't straight away walk and start doing a posture it you know the body needs to be fully aware that mind and body connection needs to be uh, there and some of you who might have attended my uh, practical lesson in that also i did this posture and i gave i was giving instruction with this only in mind that you decide first that right leg is going to be my supporting leg you push your right foot firmly into the ground you spread the toes of your right foot and step by step you can lift the other leg so here my left foot is still on the mat but i am gradually lifting it up it's not like all of a sudden i put all the load on the right leg so when you are doing while you are doing these steps one by one one by one by that time your right leg knows for sure and completely that now it has to take care and be in charge it's balancing postures are not about the weight your one leg can easily bear the weight of your entire body at least for a few good minutes so it's all about your state of mind we all have the strength to uh, you know balance on one leg or uh, whatever it takes so it's almost like you know you imagine that your uh, supporting limb whether it might be your hand or your foot you imagine like you're growing roots like it's kind of you know spread itself below the ground level to be able to stay in that posture so all this will only will only come with awareness it won't come uh, you know without uh, being aware so with this awareness we move to the next point which is slow just slow yoga uh, for a very long time had the reputation of being extremely slow but i'm not talking about that slowness i'm talking about the slowness of mind you know you slow down your thought processes you slow down your expectations from yoga there's so many uh you know wide variations in which uh, you can apply the word slow so i'll touch upon them quickly one by one of course physically also we slow down anything that's done mindlessly so you see i'm not uh, against uh, these other forms of exercise like zumba and aerobics which 
these are all they come and go they come and go because they initially they are very attractive especially to the younger people because you know there's so much energy there's music there's fast movement obviously it attracts younger crowd more so there's a lot of action but why do they these fads die down and why exactly are they fads because they are not able to stand the test of time why has yoga survived through the ages through the centuries because there's something spectacular about it initially some people might find the slowness of it boring and uh, but eventually it's that slowness which is like the slow and steady uh, thing which will give you the results whatever you're looking for and <clears throat> it also prevents injuries and any adverse effects so uh, also uh, you know running through the previous three points the breathing the awareness and the warm up so when you're so much connected to all these things automatically your physical body your physical movements will also slow down for those who are looking at calorie burning let me tell you slow workouts will definitely burn more calories than fast workouts so there's everything goes in favor of this small word slow okay so um uh, we keep these in mind slow doesn't mean old age and slow doesn't mean just uh, you know uh by choice also you can do things slowly also in yoga we try to do uh, our movements with breathing so if you are and we want to breathe slow also because we want to breathe complete so everything starts falling in place if you are uh, you know lifting your arms you are inhaling and it has to be a deep inhale <clears throat> so automatically then you can't just lift your arms up and down and unless it's a bhastrika pranayama or something in the normal course your movements will have to slow down so these were like uh, you know all can be clapped into a sort of a one topic which is like the preparatory thing another the next very important thing is to be aware of your body anatomically i'm not saying we all become doctors and uh, you know uh, try to uh, get graduation level graduate level uh, knowledge of this uh, body but it will definitely help to understand at least know uh, some names of the bigger muscles biceps of course we are all obsessed with the you know a bulky body a lot of people are so biceps everyone knows and uh, abs of course everyone knows because we all want to get a six pack but it's not in that sense that i'm talking about these uh, muscle groups but in the sense that bigger and bulkier muscles they will be able to uh, obviously sustain more weight more body weight they will be able to take so while doing a posture one needs to understand that which muscle group i should use to be able to <clears throat> you know get to the posture that i am aiming at which means that when you are uh, okay so here maybe i can uh, quickly show you some lying down postures because uh, that is the most uh, common mistake that uh, is uh, done whenever you are doing a lying down posture just make sure firstly that your back presses down although it's against the natural curvature of the spine the back is usually arched but you must press the back down so this is this belt the abdominal muscle is uh, what constitutes the core mostly so that these are engaged this is a big muscle group and when you lift your legs up here and your core is engaged then you will not have any problem doing all these uh, you know uh, difficult postures or whatever also additionally when you uh, you know some postures might require you for example you lift up your head now lifting up the head can be really strenuous on the neck for some people but again as long as you engage the core your neck will be safe and additionally of course you can use your hand supporting but my point being that 
let the big muscles do the big workout don't strain your small tiny muscles like muscle of the neck especially to <clears throat> do postures that involve a lot of weight bearing and uh, those kind of uh, things so that is uh, yeah one more illustration i would want to give here is the downward facing dog or commonly called the mountain pose or inverted that here you might notice that i'm pushing myself backwards constantly which means i'm trying to you can say push more body weight towards the legs rather than the hands if i'm like somewhere here in the inverted v i end up putting lot more weight on the head and i don't you don't need me to tell you which is a stronger part the wrist or the legs obviously the legs which can take a lot more load so we constantly try to push ourselves back in this posture now some of you might be wondering about the plank then how do we justify the plank but when we are doing a posture like a plank arms are vertical i agree there is a lot of weight on the hands but still it doesn't uh, bother us so much because then the core is engaged you understand so between these big muscle groups whether it is the core muscles the stomach abdominal muscles the glutes which we call the hips the thighs hamstrings calves upper back and you know this big muscle here uh, deltoid muscle so you have to uh, try and involve these muscles and protect the inner muscles tiny muscles of the neck wrist lower back so it goes like that and if uh, all these names that i said uh, of muscles these are ba very basic knowledge if you could not could relate to them i think you're on the right track if you could not relate to them i mean just pick up a basic anatomy book or just uh, you know just google uh, big muscle groups of the body and you will familiarize with them and it will be definitely definitely a big help in understanding your physical body so like i said before yoga is not just about doing postures it's also about understanding yourself at a mental level as well as at a physical level <coughs> so this uh, was uh, where we were anatomy and that brings us to the next point which is the counter pose now yoga is unique in the sense that uh, this concept of counter poses we have in yoga i don't think uh, any other uh, form of exercise if you are just comparing forms of exercise no other form will provide you this why we have the concept of counter poses to go a little deeper yoga is always about balance so this always balance whether it's right and left side whether it's pose and counter pose whether it's in your you know in your life yeah everything comes with the yin yang the ida pingla everything is in pairs and everything needs to be balanced there's no uh, right or wrong there's no good or bad it's just about you know like they say that we have a good and a bad inside our bodies also inside our minds also and we just uh, balance them the day and night everything in nature everything is about balance so counter pose for me is something that balances the uh or whatever the practice that we are doing so again uh, when you do pavan muktasan it uh, rounds your back and after that you do setu bandhasan which lifts the back so again there's balance also when we do something on the right side we should do equally that much on the left side so that keeps restoring the balance in the body and uh, again a little tip for people who want to become teachers when you become a teacher you are mostly uh, demonstrating you're not probably doing the complete class so uh, you know you can also call it a teacher's block because uh, sorry i'll just wait for a moment they'll let the airplane pass
and also you can ignore my pet here. She's like one of those distractions that we all must. Uh, there are all around us, but we can just uh, put them aside for the time being. Yeah. So what I was uh, talking about the teacher's block was that uh, you know when we are demonstrating, we constantly. It's usually the right side we demonstrate. We do it. We so we don't realize over a period of time. We are constantly working one side more, 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 and that side keeps getting better and better and better, and the other side gets that much less. Then when we do our own practice, because that side is already stronger, we tend to do more on that side. In the process, we make the strong side stronger, and then the other side keeps, you know, uh, even if it doesn't get any weaker, it just remains at that plateau. That growth is not there as much as on the demonstration side. So when we are demonstrating or when we are doing our own practice, we must make sure that we do equally on both sides or at least compensate when we are doing our own practice. It's a natural tendency, whatever is good, because we are all such ego is in ourselves. Even if nobody is watching, we want to do only stuff that you know we, are, we can do well. So we keep, uh, you know, uh, building up the good side. So please try to keep that balance. So that was a lot of, uh, uh, you know, you can say preaching uh, going on. Uh, so let's move a little internally. So the next uh, point that I would like to mention is internalizing. All that I have said all that we you are listening to, all that we are doing, doesn't mean much till it goes inwards. So yoga, and this is where yoga is really like, you know, it leaves all other forms, all other uh, practices behind because it really uh, passes the test of internalizing. As you are already aware, you've been attending other lectures. Uh, so yoga is not just about physical practices. There's so much simultaneously going on inside our, uh, you know, uh, brains and our hearts and our minds that contributes to the yogic growth. <clears throat> so, posture-wise also, sorry, <clears throat> whenever we do a posture, we try to wholeheartedly take it in and that is when the body starts responding to postures we don't you we already talked about awareness we if we do things with awareness only then we will able to internalize them and only then will the body remember you know it's not just blindly looking at the instructor or following the instructor it's also you know connecting with the body and of course, no body is perfect and no, uh, you know, no posture is perfect. So there might be, an instructor might be saying something. You can't blindly follow. You can't do that posture. It's all right. But don't get frustrated because of that. Once you internalize and you understand, you can always modify. Those ideas of modifying or you can even check with your teacher, should I do this posture in this way if I can't do it that way. So all that will only happen when you connect with your body, you after your posture, your everything instructions, you internalize them, you talk to yourself, you will understand that in this way I can do it better than <clears throat> that. Again, coming back to the leg raises, I'll give you a simple example. So it's common that uh, uh, a lot of people have very tight hamstrings. Hamstring is this muscle. So when I tell somebody to keep this posture, I've just simply lifted leg, one leg up and the other leg is down. It's easy for me because now my muscles have, after years of practice, they become loose. But I know it for some people, they struggle with this kind of a thing. So then I give them two options, but okay, if you can't hold this leg up at 90 degrees, you can keep it a little low. This is one option of modifying that posture. The other option might be for some people, even this may not work. So then we bend the knee and bring it up like this when the hamstring is tight. But all this you will understand only when you uh, understand the posture in relation to your own body. So we don't just blindly follow what the instructor is doing and we can 
always modify. It's also about accepting our limitations. I have a small question here. I was sitting on the question only. Um, in fact, I got it here to show, um, you know, we often sit in Vajrasana and it's the beginning of many postures like when you're doing Madhukasana and stuff. But for some people with knee issues, Vajrasana itself is avoidable. So you can simply modify it by keeping a cushion between your calf and sit on that. That immediately reduces the pressure on your knees. Because we are doing yoga not to, uh, you know, add more injuries to the body. We are doing yoga with a certain uh, uh, set of benefits in mind, but not at the cost of our health, which we already have. So internalizing uh, would basically indicate that you understand what a posture is all about vis-a-vis -vis your own body. So it's, uh, and unfortunately, a lot of us are uh, on this non-interactive media. So all the more that, you know, you have to also trust your instincts along with the teacher's instructions. So this uh, point and the next point, they go hand in hand, which is visualization. So once you do internalize, visualization comes automatically. And if it doesn't come to you, then you sort of, uh, you know, follow the instructions and uh, also the teachers often talk about what each posture, the benefits of the posture. So mentally, you know, uh, use your little imagination and some sort of animation in your mind. And, uh, you know, these visualizations, they make your postures more effective. They help you, again, understand the limitations of your body, but also the benefits of the posture. So, for example, if we do a posture like Madhukasan, so we sit in uh, Manukasan is also, by the way, called the cologne cleanser, if you're not already aware. It's, uh, we sit in Vajrasan, we make a fist with each hand, and we place the fist about three to four inches apart on either side of the belly button. We soften the abdomen here because we want to dig the fists in as deep as possible. And then, of course, we fold over like this. So Mandukasan is such a wonderful posture. If you, uh, the main benefit that is, uh, as for the text, it's not my, uh, uh, you know, the thing, that it helps remove uh, any blockages, any impurities that might be stuck in your cologne. Okay. Now, all of us would have, uh, you know, suffered uh, stomach ache as kids. Now, the child doesn't know about visualization, about the cologne, about colic. They don't know. But what is the natural thing? When we have stomach aches, we just want to press it in. So we are automatically, you know, the body knows something, the mind knows something, uh, which even we in our all our awareness and all our education, we don't know, we don't think of it. But the body wants that colic to be removed. And that is exactly what we are doing in Madhukasan to remove that blockage and to cleanse the colon. And uh, of course, well, in a lot of uh, teachers, uh, they create packages. This is the detox package and this is the weight loss package. But that doesn't change the posture. The posture remains the same. It's only the marketing of late which has changed. And this is a detox posture. This is a weight loss posture. This is a, you know, uh, age-defying posture. But yoga doesn't care, really. Yoga has really stood the test of time and it will and time and space. Now it's there all over the world. It, does, it did, never needed any, uh, you know, of these definitions. But... Uh, in, to some extent, I would say that these definitions do help us understand what each posture is doing. So it also helps us in visualizing. So uh, with this example, I'm sure next time when you do your Mandukasan, you will be able to visualize how this pressure of your face on your abdomen is in turn putting pressure on your colon and 
trying to remove any blockages or any impurities from that. But all this will not happen without the next point. And what is our next point? It is faith. So without faith, nothing will happen, no? If uh, a placebo also works in medical science and in experiments, a placebo works only because the patients believe in it that it will work. So yoga is no placebo. Yoga is really a wonderful. Uh, it's a science. It's a you know. It's a it's a universe in itself. So yoga doesn't need us, but we need yoga. So if you believe that a posture will work for you, also along with your faith, you use internalizing. You use the power of visualization. Then definitely these things will. Uh, you know, yoga will work for you. Of course, it's a slow uh, process. It's uh, and you also need to constantly, uh, you know, keep practicing. So then, definitely, it uh, works universally. So with that, we are linked to the next point, which is along with everything, we've got to be realistic. We can't, uh, you know. Uh, does think that uh, no, no, they, um, you know, she or he um, lost so much weight or they, their face is glowing, my face is not glowing. We have to be realistic that yoga works to a different extent or different bodies because there are so many factors, you know, there are uh, internal health, there's external physical, how much effort you're putting into it, how much regularity. So along with this realistic, I would, I would like to add one point is that they, you, uh, your practice also has to be very regular. So be realistic in your expectations from yoga and from yourself. If your body is not perfect, it's all right. But you try to put in all your effort in being regular in your practice because um, the body is so dynamic. It's practically all the time it's changing it's changing according to the seasons it's changing according to the our internal environment is changing as for the external environment so all the time so you can't expect that six months ago you practiced uh, you know say sarvang asan you could do it very well then for three months you didn't practice it at all and then today again you're doing it and then you will be able to do it perfectly well no because regularity is very important not only for the body, but for the mind also. You know, the mind, uh, you can't just have too much expectation that, you know, um, again, after a gap, you can't just suddenly sit on a mat and think of meditating or think of doing pranayama because body is constantly changing. So realistic and uh, expectations and being regular, they would go hand in hand. So from here, we must touch upon something again very important is and also underrated is our rest and restoration. In fact, in some places, I believe that uh, now people are only going for restoration classes. <laughs> leave, a, uh, leave aside all the, you know, all the physical and uh, everything and then they just want to because the stress levels are so high for everyone and uh, even before you you know, otherwise what we feel that rest is justified after doing the practice. But I wouldn't blame people. Thank you. So I wouldn't blame people who are just too tired just the moment they uh, come to the mat. Then where is the question of having the energy uh, of uh, you know, doing your practice? So rest and restoration, they might be underrated. Some people, uh, when they have a little less time for practice, they just quickly do maybe Surya Namaskar or a few postures and then they just want to run away to work, run away to something. I don't blame them. They have only that stay. If, even if you have 20 minutes out of that, leave two minutes at least for your Shavasana. Leave two minutes for your, uh, you know, for your mind and uh, to assimilate whatever you've done. Because uh, things are just piling up but the brain is not able to process them and it's not able to assimilate them at that speed especially something like your practice you need uh, you know time the brain needs for like a power nap you know why why are power naps such a rage because it's just a packed thing so a two minute shavasan is good enough for the 
brain to process that whatever yoga practice you've done and then you get up fresh and then so it also provides like a, uh, a sort of a boundary line between where your practice ended and where your work day or whatever your activities are that began we you know the problem with us is that there's little time and there's so much to do everything becomes a sort of like a you know like a bowl of maggie mishmash one entangled with the other brain is not able to process brain is not able to differentiate and uh, in end of the day we are so exhausted mentally physically that you know anything good also you do for your body goes away because it's not assimilated because there's lack of rest and restoration so these two are very important points of you know uh, your practice and uh, so all these points put together will automatically injury proof you and uh, of course we'll have a question and answer session so in that uh, also i'll cover a, a few more uh, postures specifically which i feel that uh, they do create some uh, adverse reactions from the body so all these points uh, now physically we also need to put in some fuel in the body so that is the next and the last point here which is the diet so diet is something that is extremely extremely important and uh, of course uh, uh, sir is going to uh, talk about all the nutrition and uh, i think in uh, year two that is a very wonderful very relevant topic and uh, of course most of us are already google gurus everyone googles everything nutritional value calorific value this value that value how much time it takes for this to burn we're only looking at labels of food packages so uh, but all that put aside basic our yogis and rishis who practice hours and hours of yoga did not uh, you know define the carbs and uh, proteins and stuff the way we do but i feel there's nothing wrong in knowing which food group you are eating but i guess we don't get overly obsessed with that and that will only happen with understanding so when you attend these uh, you know wonderful nutrition uh, lectures uh, given by sir they are so relevant and you will understand why you should eat something why not and uh, some of the food groups are really overrated so that again running like a clock through all these uh, points that we uh, i just covered the last 11 points you put them all together you will get a fair understanding of what i have been trying to say all this while mainly balance and understanding of your body understanding of your mind your uh, you know environment your surroundings and internalizing whether it's food you have to you must internalize it whether it's your practice you must internalize for doing that you must need your have your awareness your uh, you know undivided attention and to get all that together by the body you do need your rest so i'm going to end uh, this uh, monologue here and uh, hopefully uh, for the next uh, few minutes we will all be able to interact and uh, if anyone has any questions you are most welcome to ask thank you uh namaste monica ji uh, can i go ahead with my question yes please please yeah um you mentioned about uh, main for my question is those who don't have a very good abdominal uh, posture and very uh, weak muscles abdominal muscles what can we do to strengthen the core uh, area and how can we uh, maintain some uh, basic discipline to avoid uh, some kind of any kind of uh, injuries on the uh, spinal lower spine sure so you are pramita right yeah so pramita that's a very very relevant and a very important point uh, you picked up um 
yes core strength uh, is lacking in many of us especially uh, women it's not about gender bias but also especially women who have had the children because then the uh, abdominal muscles they stretched and uh, many many of the muscle fibers they broke at that time so we cannot sew back physically whatever has been stretched like you can imagine elastic fibers they stretched and now they are uh so they've snapped at some point during pregnancy or childbearing but it's nothing against that beautiful experience for women uh whatever remaining muscles we have we can try to strengthen them um firstly you can in your day to day uh, activities also you can especially walking if you're walking you can just keep the stomach slightly tight so that beca becomes your first step of exercise don't just let your stomach hang loose because then with time with age with the weight with gravity it's going to hang loose more and the remaining muscle fibers also they start becoming weak and they might snap so uh that is the first step now coming to the leg raises uh, because i didn't keep a towel here can we just take the camera again i'm going to uh thank you manju so when we lie down and do these uh, because these lying down uh, exercises or yoga postures whatever you call them are the most effective in strengthening your uh, uh, stomach muscles but you see this natural curvature of the back that is nature that's how nature made that the back needs to be flexible also for all the movements that we need. so to begin with if you feel very uh, uh, high arch here you can fold a small towel and keep it at the uh, this arch of your lumbar but we don't want to start depending on it so we want to you know use it for a few times and then gradually come out of it the best way then would be to pull your legs in like this when you pull your legs in it's like stretching the back and it's flattening the back so this would be a good point so what i what i mean is you just don't directly lift your legs up you first bend the knees and pull them fully like you would do pavan mukhasan so that stretches the back and sometimes you might even even if you don't have a towel available you might just might need to little slightly uh you know stuff your hands under the curvature of the back and then you can or you can one by one lift your legs up and again try to keep the stomach tight so these are the safer ways of going into a posture without you know because why we need to do all this exercise because when the back is arched it is unsupported and that is where the problem happens a lot of people start getting back ache when they start doing any of these related to these kind of postures because the back is unsupported they don't realize the core as i'm describing the core is here which constitutes the abdominal muscle we all know that but we don't think about the back the core in its completeness is like a cylinder so a cylinder will uh, be weak is it's not complete at any point you are talking about weakness here but i am also talking about weakness in the back so as much as you are thinking of strengthening the stomach muscles we also need to strengthen the back muscles and nobody gets stomach problem you know we all get back pain issues so we are more a little more partial towards the back and we want to keep it supported while doing these postures not only this uh we do these postures where we lie down on the stomach and these uh, uh, you know these leg lifts or or shalabhasan so all these postures are also very good for strengthening the back along with that sorry i hold that comment i'll have to come to that so they help strengthen the stomach as well as the uh back so i hope i could answer uh, at least a part of your query uh, pramita and uh, it's again it doesn't happen uh, in day one but like i told you two things most important 
fold your knees into the stomach and then lift your legs up. That will press your back down. Secondly, if your back still arches, keep a thin napkin or a towel to fill up this gap under your back, between the back and your mat to keep your back supported. While you do postures, that will strengthen your stomach. So it's all like overlapped one along with the other. As your stomach gets stronger, your back will also get stronger. It will not arch up that much and you will start doing these postures better. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Monica. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, there was someone who put up a query about breathing. Uh, so can you just um, bring up your question again, please? Sure. So what I meant was, is there like a uh, general thing that if you're bringing the legs closer to the body, then you're supposed to breathe in? Uh, you know, like, is this like a pattern that we follow? Absolutely, Sahil. There is a pattern, there is a thumb rule, there is a rule, a golden rule. Everything is there. <laughs> <laughs> Everything yeah. is uh, described and prescribed. So uh, when you start with your breathing, in, in the beginning, you did your deep abdominal breathing. Well, how was it going? It was like you expand the abdomen and the chest when you inhale and you uh, squeeze them in when you exhale. So this is basic yogic breathing that you've been practicing uh, in every session. Now, we go with the same pattern. How? You lift your arms. What is this doing? This is expanding your torso. So automatically, you will inhale. Scientifically talking, when you expand, there's a low pressure inside the body. So anyways, the air will rush in. So whether it's yogically or scientifically, it's the same process. Inhale, exhale. Okay, I'll give you several examples. In fact, uh, I also want to share one of my uh, experiences here. I'll just come to that. But before that, uh, let me just, uh, you know, when you're rising up, from a forward bending posture. So from Bada Hastasana, if you're rising up, inhale, inhale up, exhale, bend. Okay, inhale, expand the arms, exhale, release. But twisting, exhale, inhale, center. So while you're you know, sitting in front of the camera, you can try also automatically you're squeezing something you will exhale when you're twisting inhale when you come back at the center also uh, some postures uh, like i said i'll share one experience when i was practicing see i uh, basically uh, you know came up with this uh, uh, lecture because of uh, so many issues that i came across with and at that time, Google also was not that prevalent. And I didn't know uh, how, where to ask my questions. Like, whenever, whenever I would do Bhujang Asan, I would get a headache. Okay, so for the longest time, I kept trying Bhujang Asan, but was never happy with it. Because nobody told, nobody mentioned that you should inhale when you're rising up in Bhujangasana. So probably my body, my brain was uh, oversensitive. And uh, for even if for a split second, if you don't inhale while rising up in these kind of postures. Uh, yes, Mamta, just give me two minutes. So if you don't inhale, maybe for a split second, uh, your brain doesn't get its supply of oxygen. And uh, maybe I was oversensitive and I would always get a headache. But the day I figured this out, that you must, must inhale while rising up in Bhujangasana, my headaches stopped. So in fact, these are the kind of experiences that I want to share with everyone so that, uh, you know, you don't have these issues. Uh, did that answer your query, Sahil? Sahil? Are you there? Oh, okay. Thank you, Sahil. Uh, Mamta ha and uh, some other name, I, it's not complete. Uh, I think you have some query. Uh, 
Please speak up, Mamta. Hi, yes, uh, this is Mamta and Samarth. Uh, we usually do uh, the class together. Uh, oh, this is great. me and my husband. So uh, looks like, uh, Monica, ma'am, you read my mind because I was about to ask a question on Bhujangasan uh, itself. One is, of course, yeah, inhaling while raising up. Second thing is what I have uh, heard from some of my friends is they get tennis elbow, you know, while doing Bhujangasan at times. So why would that happen? Uh, see, that happens uh, basically Bhujangasan. Why we are doing it? We are doing Bhujangasan to strengthen our back. Mm -hmm. But what your friends uh, seem to be doing wrong is that instead of putting the effort on the back, they are taking all the effort on their hands and their arms okay. to rise up and to mm -hmm. hold the posture or however they are doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, Firstly, of course, I don't know how uh, your friends are doing it, but I'll show you how Bhujangasana is done. And mm -hmm. it's uh, definitely not one of the very easy postures to do. Uh, I'll also show you how a lot of people do it wrong. So, in fact, first I'll do, I'll show you how I've seen a lot of people do it uh, is, uh, you know, bound of course here. And they do it like this. You mm -hmm. Up and your shoulders are up, your body is somewhere sinking, and you're kind of you know just ready to slump down, but your arms are like uh, holding on to the posture. Mm -hmm. So much that's wrong with this posture. Um, firstly, the back is relaxed. The back is what is supposed to work. It's a posture that is meant for the back muscles to work. Second, when you lift up like this your shoulders are pulled close to the ears. You're, you know, it also indicates how heavy your body is and it's sinking down and your hands are just trying to hold them up. Mm -hmm. So this is wrong again. This is how your body should, can you feel the difference? This versus this. This is the way to do Bhujangasana. And uh, uh, also another big issue with doing it this way is again, you have the jugular vein here. You're blocking all your oxygen and your blood going upwards by keeping your shoulders like this. So mm -hmm. not in Bhujangasana, in all your postures, unless you're doing this for resting, don't keep your shoulders like this. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. so basically, Bhujangasana should be done. Elbows will remain bent. Mm -hmm. Elbows are bent and we squeeze the elbows a little close to the rib cage. Shoulders okay. are down. And tighten the hips, tighten the glutes so that the weight of your body is bone. Of course, hands are also there for support, but you should be able to hold Bhujangasana even without the hands. How? By using the back and stomach muscle. So next time your friends, they want to do Bhujangasana, tell them to do this self-test, tighten the muscles of the abdomen and the stomach and slowly remove the hand support. Yeah, I think that will be the best, right? Then uh, yeah, try it without the hand hands. Rest also, yeah. you're welcome. Thank you. Okay. One more question, if you don't mind. Uh, so the second one is when we are sitting and doing uh, the uh, leg bend, Remember, uh, so there's this uh, exercise in which we do the leg bend. Uh, we bring the knee closer to the chest. So in that, when do you inhale and when do you exhale? I would imagine while you're bringing the leg closer to the chest, then you exhale. And when you're strengthening the leg, then you're inhaling. Is that the right thing? Yeah, sure, sure. Oh. Because anyways, when the leg is coming in, it's pushing your abdomen in and the breath is going out. So naturally, you <laughs> exhale at that point and you inhale uh, in the opposite direction. All right. Thank you so much. These were the Thank questions. You. Uh, Sonika. Sonika. Yes, Sonika, you can ask your question, please. Uh, okay. I can unmute now. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, so my question is... Uh, uh, regarding uh, leg stretching, when I try to raise one of my legs, I'm not able to take it even to 90 degrees. Probably because the inner thigh muscles are not uh, very strong. And also, uh, when I'm like doing Pada Hastasan, uh, otherwise, I mean, like when I do Hastapadasan standing, 
uh, it's okay. But uh, when I do Paschimottanasan while sitting, then I'm not able to keep my back erect. And therefore, I'm not able to, you know, bend from the lower back because unless your back is erect, you, there's a tendency to hunch your back and then you don't Pare. reach your uh, toes, right? So Pare. is there a way to strengthen uh, one, um, the inner thigh so that I can have a good stretch? That's one question. The second is that my arms are weak. So when I try to do chakrasan, I'm not able to lift the upper part of my body uh, on my palms. So there's a lot that you can do before uh, you attempt chakrasan. And also chakrasan, uh, one should only do when you know, you've done a lot of other postures because it's a little tricky. You just might land on the top of your head and, uh, you know, that uh, will create the more unnecessary trouble. And that's exactly what I'm here to ask you to avoid. So don't uh, attempt postures. Uh, Chakrasana is one of the advanced postures. So let me come to the first point first and then we will come to this. So talking about your um, struggle with lifting the leg up, uh, you are saying inner thigh, but I feel that maybe there's also more uh, tightness in your hamstring. And uh, thank you, thank you, Pishan. So uh, there's more issue with the tightness of the glutes and hamstrings. Which are the glutes and hamstrings? Glutes are basically the hips, and hamstrings are the muscles that are at the back of the leg, between the bend of the knee and the hip. So because of those muscles being stiff, that stiffness sometimes even starts spreading to lower back. So, which is why you're probably not able to, uh, you know, do a good uh, forward bend. You're, you don't find it satisfying. So, you can use initially a cushion like this. Okay. Don't sit on the cushion. You don't have to sit on the cushion. You sit. You slightly bend, stretch forward, and you tuck this cushion in this gap. That is when, when you sit up straight, you will get a little bit support here, which will prevent your back from rounding. I think this is perpetually what is happening with your back. And again, see, we have to understand that the entire body is like a continuum. You can't have very strong abs and weak thighs or weak uh, legs and strong upper body. If you have a strong body, it will be strong throughout. And if you have a not so strong body, then because each muscle is also supporting the other group of muscles. So uh, when we strengthen, when we do yoga, it's you're strengthening the entire body head to toe. In fact, a lot of people ask me, tell me a posture for strengthening the abs or strengthening the thighs. But uh, there's no one single posture. And luckily... Every posture helps you strengthen every part of your body. Each yoga posture is so multifaceted. So again, coming back to this, you can slightly tuck in the cushion. Don't sit on the cushion completely because then you will be less uh, well supported. And just practice this. Now this seems very easy, but it's taking a lot of effort. And I'm not even talking about the back. I'm starting at the legs first. You start pressing the bends of your knees into the mat. You start tightening the thighs. If you wish, you can even place your hands under the bends of your knees. And as if you are crushing your hands, you press your legs into the uh, mat. So what this will do, this will uh, strengthen your legs to the extent that when you pull upwards, your legs are giving you that strength to lift up. I don't know how much uh, everyone is familiar with the, the laws of physics, but simple law of physics, everything has an action and an equal reaction. So the more you push your legs into the mat, the more your mat will push you upwards and give you this lift. So yoga is very beautiful, very scientific. You can apply everything, your anatomy to uh, physiology, to physics, to maths, trigonometry, geometry, everything you can apply in your uh, yoga practice. The second point you can try doing is to keep the legs a little bit apart, not very wide, but about the width, the distance of your mat is the distance, or the width of your mat is the distance of your legs. Then you start like this. And wherever you reach, I'm not saying you reach for your toes directly, you can drop your hands on your knees and with that support, try to walk them out. <laughs> Still, this may not happen in one day, 
but mentally you should know what you are uh, trying to achieve you are not trying to achieve this it's a wrong aim to think that you want to touch your forehead to your knees because then you are rounding your back and you are self restricting your posture instead of that imagine like you want to touch your chest to your thighs and you want to touch your chin to your shin and then you can keep a straight back and you can bend much better much deeper it's not about i'm not judging and you also don't judge yourself that i cannot reach my toes i'm useless i can't do yoga it's not like that it's about where you should get the effect of your posture the effect of your paschimottanasana and for that matter padhastasana also is to stretch the back entire back is supposed to stretch but least stretch over here maximum stretch at the back of the legs so in fact even uh, like medical doctors of course they advise you not to do forward bending uh, when you have back pain but if you are doing it the correct way it's not even you know you don't even feel anything in this part of your back all the stretch goes here and coming to your next point when you lie down and you do your leg raises again you need the stretch over here so to do anything when you lie down lifting your legs pulling them closer in this part needs to stretch so mostly we are working towards stretching this muscle the hamstring little bit calf little bit glutes so when this region of your body is uh, nicely stretched you will be able to do all your postures uh, you know to your satisfaction and to get the benefit so this is a wrong aim to pull in the stomach and try to touch your forehead to the knees so i'm repeating lead from the chest lead from the chin and then you can bend as far as you know your body allows third point you mentioned is the chakrasan please don't attempt it right now because you are yourself saying that your arms are weak you can uh, do all the other postures like i showed bhujangasana before this like you uh, we were doing uh, parvatasana do it the correct way pushing your hands out backwards so this gives a lot of strength to the upper back so after doing the, this for maybe several weeks or even months if you if chakrasana is your aim uh, don't rush into it i would say do all these postures well then you can do some side plank once you are you feel enough strength because at least this posture won't harm you uh, that much if something goes wrong you can start with side plank with one knee down so all this is aimed at strengthening your arm before you go in for that this so chakrasan you can keep it as your finale Thank you so much, Monica Ji. That was really good explanation. Thank Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Minakshi. Yes, Minakshi Dua. Uh, your mic is still on mute. Thank you, Nidhi. Thank you. Uh, Minakshi, uh, take a question from the chat box. She has posted, "What caution to be taken if we have high BP?" Minakshi's okay. question. Sure. So uh, again, high BP is kind of a general term, and uh, when you are practicing, uh, if you're on medication and your BP is controlled with the medication, uh, you're almost pretty much as good as the others but also there are other factors to consider like your age like your weight and uh, you know any other uh, issues health issues so when you're doing pranayam kapalbhati if you've learned it i'm not sure if you're already practicing kapalbhati maybe you can do a few lesser rounds of kapalbhati uh, you can avoid too many forward bending postures 
and uh, you know you can avoid doing anything that goes very fast so don't attempt very fast uh, rounds of surya namaskar for example and uh, <clears throat> you know so basically try to keep your practice a little moderate and uh, प्रॉपर ब्रीदिंग if you're not breathing correctly see blood is also going along with the breath only na blood is flowing in the body along with breath so when you slow down your practice a little bit it will probably be forward bending postures only again that cause a rush of blood or uh, you know if you're going down too fast and coming up too fast uh, without taking care of your breathing so you can slow down a little exhale while coming down inhale while rising up so and you can uh, avoid those uh, kind of incidents of uh, and also a lot of times uh, when you're doing uh, postures where you lie down face down like postures again like bhujangasan so i would suggest you stay a little longer in makarasan probably your body is taking a little longer to adjust itself slow down your practice do more of breathing in your resting postures and then uh, you can do your postures avoid very fast and very deep forward bending postures thank you vinakshi thank you uh monica did there a few questions in the chat box one is by pradeep ji about slight clearance of breathing pattern in balanced postures like chair and tree posture uh there once you come into the posture you breathe normal don't uh, over stress the breathing let it flow naturally because if you're focused too much on your breathing you might again lose balance you might lose the uh, you know awareness of your posture so there is no uh, mostly breathing is important when we are coming into a posture and coming out of a posture if you're holding a posture like a balancing posture then you just breathe normally so um, again i'll explain um, when your body when your torso is expanding you're inhaling when you're releasing a posture mostly it's an exhale it uh, changes in some postures like uh, when you're doing um, you know posture like uh, what do you say setu bandhasan bridge pose then you inhale rise up and exhale come down from the posture mostly if you don't understand how to breathe in a posture just let nature do its job naturally we breathe correct the problem comes when we interfere with the breathing and by overthinking we sometimes spoil it so naturally the breath will automatically you try exhaling uh, you try inhaling when you're doing a twist you will find it so difficult which means it's a wrong way so during going into a twist we naturally the breath will go out and balancing postures particularly there is uh, once you reach the posture there is uh, no particular pattern you just breathe normal right the next question is i had a shoulder injury some time back the injury is healed now but i feel the hand is still not as strong as it used to be earlier how can i bring the strength back um so it's a uh... it's a long process unfortunately bad that you had that injury uh, i don't know anything about this person uh, really like the age and again any other uh, issues and what caused the injury but uh, then i'll just give a general answer that uh, you know there uh, the most the biggest thing to avoid is to then offload the what we also do subconsciously if supposing your right shoulder is injured then everything we transfer all the load to the other shoulder to the other side which in turn creates a equal uh, you know uh, sort of uh, wear and tear and a problem on the other side also so for some time you can avoid 
uh, some postures like, uh, you know, although I mentioned that Bhujangasan, we are not supposed to use the arm strength, but we end up using it. So you can avoid these kind of postures where there's a lot of load on the arms. Plus, when we have these kind of injuries, even after they are healed, there is always a lot of scar tissue uh, internally. There might be like, you know, uh, still healing happening, although you may not be feeling the pain. So it's uh, important to keep that part of the body mobilized. These are very simple moves. They are not non, uh, you know, they are non-load bearing, but they keep the mobility of it because especially shoulder and hip, these are joints that are attached to a lot of muscles and uh, a spasm in one will, you know, affect the other muscle groups also adversely. So all these kind of movements, whether it's this, what I'm showing, or there's also, uh, you know, more, you bring your arms at the back, you hold one elbow, pull the arm in this direction. And always remember, do both sides equally. Having injury in one part doesn't mean that you only, you know, pamper that part. You do both the sides equally. You do this stretch. So but don't overdo these, uh, you know, uh, these postures. Gradually, the strength uh, will only come back with, you know, moderate uh, activity and moderate. Then once you feel that you are a little getting a little stronger, then you can practice postures like Bhujangasan. Hold them for like 10 seconds in the beginning and gradually you can increase the, uh, because these are very good postures also. Like, you know, partly load bearing postures, they will be good for strengthening these uh, injured parts of the body. All right, thank you. Just one last question. Sure. Uh, any suggestions on removing double chin in yoga? So, um, again, I don't know about this person, their age or, uh, you know, overall, uh, if they are obese. But again, I'll give a general answer. There are these uh, facial yoga is a, a very good uh, form. When you're doing postures like Bhujangasan, uh, even uh, Matsyasan, stick your tongue out. So the tongue is again uh, sort of a muscle only and there there are these uh, you know whatever submandibular uh, region over here there are also muscles. So when you stick your tongue out you are stretching just like in the rest of the body. Again we need to only exercise and of course if uh, so I'm showing you the side view I don't know if it'll be visible on the camera you are stretching this entire part when you're sticking the tongue out. All the more this becomes effective when you try sticking the tongue out while doing matsyasan, where the neck is already stretched. Matsyasan or any posture where you've tilted or you can simply sit and tilt your head back and try to imagine your tongue touching the ceiling. So you start stretching this part and of course, if you are overweight, uh, there's naturally a tendency for uh, the fat to accumulate here. If you are uh, aged, again, all the muscles become weak, the skin becomes weak, skin fibers get a uh, little uh, uh, worn and torn. So, uh, you know, to some extent, these stretches will help you. That's all. all right. Thank you, Monica. That was all the questions. Over Thank to you, sir. Everyone. Thank you, Monica. And the <laughs> questions that came up today, and uh, I'm sure there would be many more, uh, show how much uh, interest your session has evoked. So we would like to have you once again, hopefully quite soon. And uh, you talked about the diet. We'll not be talking about the diet in this particular course, but the next one, Yes.02, which will start on the 7th of April, is about diet. That's where we'll go into the details of nutrition. So with that, thank you once again and hope to have you again soon with us. My pleasure and uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. And I uh, hope you all enjoyed as much as I did uh, conducting this session. <laughs> thank you. Have a great day. Thank you, Priya. Thank you, everyone. We end with the meditative music.
and for tomorrow we will have another live practical session by one of our guest speaker uh, miss vidya so be present the same time and thank you today for joining Thank you.